Today, we're going to focus. We have a guest who is a Green Party candidate for the City Council of New York City from Astoria, Queens, New York. His name is Edwin De Jesus, and he should pop up here on the screen in a minute so he can tell you about his campaign, about himself. Hi, Edwin. And what the issues are in his race, and then we'll have a question and answer. So the floor is yours, Edwin. Thank you so much for having me, Howie. Hello, everyone watching. My name is Edwin De Jesus. I'm a lifelong resident of Astoria, Queens. I was a former national advance for the Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign, uh, but after that became, uh, you know, something that was a failure partially due to the coronavirus, partially due to the fact that the DNC had their own shadow app in the Iowa caucus that had a domino effect and made it look like Mayor Pete won that caucus. Uh, you know, Super Tuesday came crashing down. Uh, I was very disappointed, as were many progressives. And I think that was kind of the turning point for me where I realized, why are we trying to shoehorn this uh, working class movement into a corporate party? Because at the end of the day, we can't have a revolution inside of this duopoly. It's just not going to happen. You look at some of our, our heroes or perhaps former heroes like AOC and the squad, and as of recently, they voted uh, present on the Iron Dome funding bill. Uh, they voted to increase capital police funding by, uh, funding by $2 billion. It's becoming more and more apparent that the Democratic Party really isn't truly the home of progressives. They will do anything in their power to kneecap progressives who are trying to reform it from within the party. So I decided after voting for you, Howie, in 2020, that I wanted to take the uh, measures into my own hands in my own community and fight for the most vulnerable uh, people living in Astoria. Queens was, in fact, an epicenter of the pandemic, particularly Elmhurst, Queens. And it's not just because of a virus that everybody suffered, but because of the failure of politicians on both sides of the aisle who failed to meet the moment and put profits over people. So now I'm running in this general election on November 2nd uh, to have our voices heard for people who are suffering and realize that Democrats and Republicans are just not on the side of the working class. So what are the some of the top issues in, in uh, your beef with your opponent, who is Tiffany Caban, who is a known as a, a socialist backed by the Democratic Socialists of America? What's going on there? What are the issues in there in, involved in that? Yeah, so Tiffany Caban is what we call a cosplay revolutionary. Uh, she has already made a peace agreement with Eric Adams, and she's not even in office. What's she going to do next, make a peace agreement with Wall Street and Big Pharma? I mean, it's obvious here uh, what they're trying to do. They're trying to get in good with the Democratic establishment, uh, and that's just not what's going to cut it. People are starting to wake up. You know, uh, Keith Powers, who's on the criminal, the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, said that Caban is, quote, flexible on issues such as the closure of Rikers Island. So you're telling me that a, a so-called progressive uh, is flexible on the issue of modern day slavery? I mean, give me a break. Why are so many uh, people in America in prison? I mean, you have one in four world prisoners in American prisons, predominantly African-American, Latino-American a lot of it has to do with the war on drugs. And so one of my big issues is to decriminalize all drugs, uh, specifically uh, drugs like psilocybin, also known as magic mushrooms, because of its therapeutic uh, benefits on mental health. NYU has been doing a lot of research on this lately, and they have discovered that psilocybin can nearly cure or even fully, uh, fully cure instances of depression, suicidal thoughts, PTSD, anxiety, stress, and trauma. We are undergoing a mental health crisis right now where one in 10 Americans have seriously contemplated suicide, uh, which goes in tandem with this economic crisis that has been created by our politicians. At the end of the day, I don't think that somebody like Tiffany Caban is necessarily a bad intentioned person, but whatever agenda they have for the working class, they know it's not going to come to fruition. And it's just a matter of the fact that the party leadership sets the direction of the party. So even though you might be a fighter for single payer health care, uh, like how he is, like I am, uh, Tiffany Caban says that she is. But at the end of the at the end of the day, what did the DNC say last year? Medicare for all is not part of our platform. Joe Biden has specifically promised to veto Medicare for all if it came across his desk. That's why I'm fighting to refund the New York City care program, which provides health insurance to the thousands of New Yorkers who are either uninsured or underinsured. Let's not forget 
that one in three COVID deaths could have been prevented if we had single payer Medicare for all. So in addition to what we're doing with this vaccine rollout is that we need to provide free medical grade N95 masks, expand our testing so that employers can cover testing for employees and give every single person healthcare as a human right. So remember you're talking to people all over the country. So you, you're kind of talking like you're talking to folks in New York. So Eric Adams is the democratic uh, nominee for mayor. He's gonna win. Uh, he was one of the more conservative candidates in the field former cop. Uh, he ran on more cops, more law and order against people that were trying to build off the, you know, George Floyd protests like Maya Wiley. Uh, and he won out uh, narrowly in a ranked choice vote. And uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, they, they did a ranked choice vote, but it was only for the primary in New York City. So you don't have the opportunity to tell people they can vote for you as a green because they really want progressive policies and not worry that uh, you and Kabam will split the vote and some crazy Republican will get elected. And so, you know, that's an issue. I wonder, you know, have you been able to get Kabam to come out on that question of proportional representation, not just ranked choice voting, extending it to the general election, but proportional representation for the New York City Council? which had it between 1937 and 1945. And they went from being a one party democratic council to a council with five to seven parties over the five elections they had when they used proportional RCV. So that means you had multi-member districts, you rank your choices and uh, you get a proportional representation of the different political viewpoints. So I wonder if uh, you've been able to smoke Caban out on that. Well, yes, we are going to have our debate on October 20th, where I do plan to push her on several of these issues. And you are correct. For those of you who don't know, New York City has a closed primary system. So the ranked choice voting really only benefits the party that ha dominates control in the electoral uh, pol political sphere here, which is the Democratic Party. You only have two council members who are Republicans. Uh, and so another thing is that you have to be registered as a Democrat months in advance of the primary. So if, if you uh, are like many people who don't even really think about politics until the very end, you have no choice to even register to vote in time for that primary. And you're definitely right that I'm going to pressure her and ask her, well, do you support ranked choice voting, not just in these closed primaries and special elections, but will you support them in general elections as well? I will also push her on the issue of proportional representation because I believe that is fundamental to equality, uh, equality in our democracy. And one of the biggest issues for me personally in our district is gentrification. A lot of the local mom and pop shops have been going out of business due to the greed of large corporations like Amazon in recent years. And if you uh, followed the Amazon HQ2 story, you would know that the council member of that district, Jimmy Van Bramer, was a huge supporter of a tool for city council members known as member deference. Uh, Tiffany Caban and every other uh, council candidate who agreed to all of the uh, policies in the questionnaire circulated by AOC's Courage to Change PAC, the same uh, Courage to Change PAC that tried donating $250,000 to right-wing Democrat incumbents who are anti-Medicare for all, every single candidate, including Tiffany Caban, agreed to eliminate the tool known as member deference. And member deference is when a city council member can say, uh, uh, take priority over uh, rezonings and developments in their district. So for example, the people elect a leader, Say they want to elect Green candidate Edwin de Jesus. Now they want to put this luxury high-rise uh, uh, building in the middle of Dittmar's Boulevard, which is one of the main streets that everybody loves. Uh, nobody's going to want that there. Without member deference, a council member from, say, Manhattan can go and step on our toes and say, no, you have to build that. We're green lighting that project. So it is actually detrimental to the future of our culture, to the future of rent prices and the displacement of locals. Uh, food prices are increasing, uh, and that's why I believe preserving member deference uh, would keep the uh, the price of, for uh, for example, a bacon, egg, and cheese uh, at three fifty dollars, uh, three dollars and fifty cents a roll, which is what most working class New Yorkers expect to pay for that kind of sandwich when they go to their local bodega. And actually, let me just add one more thing. 
One of the things that I also support is rent stabilization for small businesses so that when their lease is up, uh, it can only be increased by a certain uh, percentage so that they don't get priced out and the big retail giants and fast food giants take over the community. Astoria, there's actually a documentary on this, is the most diverse neighborhood in the country in terms of the number of ethnicities represented. That is going to change the more that we allow it to become like Williamsburg, for example, where food prices and rent has skyrocketed, not, uh, not just after the pandemic, but even beforehand, we have seen the closures of many uh, small businesses in our district and the results are frightening. So Edwin, before we get to questions people are asking, um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background? You know, you're coming up in Astoria, uh, your education, uh, what you were involved in besides coming out of the Sanders campaign. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I've lived here my whole life, which isn't super long. I'm 24 years old. I attended a high school in the district, a public school. I've, I've attended public school, elementary, middle school, all in the district. Uh, my high school is called the Academy for Careers in Television and Film. So it's what's known as a career and technical education school. There are several schools around New York City that specialize in trades uh, like filmmaking, like culinary arts, like construction. This is something I think we need to expand so that all of our students don't uh, have to be in thousands of dollars in debt after they graduate from high school pursuing a college degree. I think we can expand our job training programs and services for those who want to have more technical trades after high school. I was fortunate enough to attend Columbia University on a full scholarship, uh, but there are many of my neighbors uh, especially in the in the Harlem neighborhood surrounding Columbia University, in which they are currently gentrifying with their Manhattanville campus, they don't have the same opportunity that I had to study on a scholarship. I ended up studying film and media, and shortly after graduating, I've done a lot of gig work in the film and TV industry as a production assistant. A production assistant is one of the lower tier jobs on a film crew, but it's my favorite because you get to do a little bit of everything. You have to kind of be a jack of all trades. Yeah, sometimes you might have to get the coffee for the actors. Other times you're in charge of guarding and transporting thousands of dollars worth of equipment. So at the end of the day, filmmaking has always been my art and my passion and my drive. But I realize why not use the power of film and cinema to inspire political change and social change and inspire people to, do, uh, to engage in more activism and take it to the streets. And so I'm using all of my skill sets acquired as a filmmaker during this campaign to really uh, push people uh, to make a difference in their respective communities. Well, I see in the chat, people are saying we should have candidates like Edwin on every week. And we're gonna have the next two weeks, other candidates, Connor Mulvaney's running for city council in Pittsburgh, and then Madeline Hoffman and Heather Warburton are running for governor and lieutenant governor as Greens in New Jersey. And then, uh, the week after that, there's still another week for the election. They also mentioned bringing incumbents in. We did have Cam Gordon, an incumbent member of the Minneapolis City Council, who's up for re-election. So, yeah, we're going to do more of this, particularly now as we approach the election. And there's the question from Amy that I just answered. So I just wanted to get that out there while it was fresh. Okay, Eric Gray asks, Edwin, what is your plan to educate people in order to strengthen community-based political power? That's an excellent question, Eric. Thank you so much. So in addition to what I mentioned about the career and technical education programs, we need to be funding community leaders on the ground. There are people who, without any backing from the local government, are out there uh, taking uh, the youth uh, and encouraging them to do things like tree mulching and street cleanups and graffiti cleanups. These are the types of programs that are, you know, completely independent. Uh, they're very much in tandem with mutual aid efforts. These are how we can get people to actually feel like they're part of a community. So that way, if they don't have, say, a, a, a parental figure or some sort of guidance in their life, they can go down the path of compassion and community. You know, this is one of the reasons that New York City has been seeing a spike in crime is because we don't have, uh, for certain people, a purpose. We are not giving people a certain purpose. Uh, we are uh, giving people the bare minimum to survive. And in turn, uh, they are going down the wrong path of perhaps gang and gun violence. So I think that if we can strengthen our community leaders, the ones who are really um, uh, engaged with their, local, with their respective communities, those in the public housing, NYCHA, for example, uh, these people have been abandoned. 
by the two-party system. A lot of the promises are made every uh, election cycle, and then it's never delivered. In fact, they want to privatize the public housing here in New York City. So the more that we can strengthen our leaders, the more we can educate our youth and set them on the right path. So, Gira, uh, Brown asks, Edwin, what are your plans for finding gentrification in Astoria and preserving ethnic communities? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Gareth, for that question. Uh, it goes back to my earlier point where we have these large corporations taking over uh, because the small businesses can't compete. One of my proposals is giving direct uh, relief aid to these businesses in the form of cash payments, kind of like a universal basic income. Not necessarily the same way that Andrew Yang proposes it by gutting social services, but by adding it as a supplemental form of income, because extinguishing poverty is a way that we can actually uh, increase entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, people, you know, if you give them money, sure, some people will take advantage and they'll they'll use it to buy uh, Gucci and Prada and, and indulge in, in, in drugs. Others who have the inclination and ambition will start their own small businesses. And I've seen it happen firsthand with people who are very close to me. If you can empower the locals to start their own clothing boutiques, uh, just like my fiance has recently done in the district, this is something that's going to keep the culture alive. Uh, but the more that we allow um, these union jobs to be taken away and allow these corporations like Target to come in uh, because we don't have something called member deference, uh, then we are going to look at accelerated uh, gentrification, uh, which has a lot to do with the COVID pandemic. You know, it's really sad uh, the extent to which small businesses had to shoulder the burden of the uh, mitigation of the spread of the virus when we really aren't pushing the same burden on the large corporations. For example, you can go inside TJ Maxx uh, in the height of the pandemic uh, and people were packed in there like sardines. But meanwhile, you have others uh, out on the street who are doing their best to build these little wooden uh, fixtures out on the sidewalk so that they can just increase their square footage by barely a few feet to retain a few customers. I mean, we really owe it a lot to these small businesses who are out on the front lines and enforcing our public safety measures to be given back money <laughs> instead of giving those uh, those tax abatements to the wealthiest, most powerful large corporations and a few dozen billionaires who buy out our politicians every year. Edwin, uh, I got a question. You know, in Berlin, in this election they just had in Germany, the people voted for a referendum, it's advisory, to expropriate 200,000 homes owned by corporate landlords and turn them into public housing. Is there any discussion in New York City to counter de Blasio's privatization plans, which is backed by HUD, with uh, expanding public housing by taking over some corporate landlords? I did hear about this. No, that is a wonderful idea. I wish the New York City Council members in New York had the courage to propose something like that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The mayor's plan, uh, otherwise known as the blueprint, which enables RAD and PAC to privatize the public housing, uh, you even have progressives uh, who are elected as DSA officials like Julia Salazar, for example, who when we pushed her along with some other housing activists to get a concrete answer, will you vote no on this blueprint? There was no yes or no. It was just uh, a platitude of, well, you know, I support the NYCHA. No, that wasn't the question. Are you going to stand up to the mayor's blueprint or do you want to cozy up to him because you know he has that political power and that it's going to benefit your political career? As I've stated before, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I'm not going to use my leverage to advance my own political career. I'm going to use my leverage to fight uh, for seniors, for disabled community, uh, for low-income folks, for uh, veterans and students. And if I end up uh, getting kicked out because I use my leverage on that, well, that's a job well done. And I'll do everything in my power to fight for the residents of public housing who have been neglected time and time again, especially during this public health crisis where there is a rodent infestation in the public housing. And these rodents are carrying ticks, which are spreading Lyme disease to the NYCHA residents. And nobody's talking about it because the people who run the NYCHA are corrupt and they bully any uh, tenant association presidents who speak out against them. In one instance, I know of a tenant association president who has been speaking truth to power and informing her residents about the corruption behind NYCHA. And guess what they did? They uh, reduced the amount of, of cans of food 
given to the NYCHA residents as a way to spite the tenant association president. Could you imagine the lack of compassion, the, the, the viewing of your neighbor as, some, as, as below human to the point where you're going to let politics actually starve people to death? And I mean, just look at the homelessness crisis that we have today. It's very apparent that the politicians would much rather prioritize their own careers than actually making sure that everyone has housing guaranteed as a human right. John Ralston asks, Edwin, you mentioned member deference as a progressive municipal, municipal policy you support. What are other municipal progressive policies Green should pursue throughout the country? Thank you. Yeah, uh, one thing that I fight, uh, wanna fight for is Metro cards for all. Uh, there shouldn't be a reason that you have to spend a whole dollar just to buy a new Metro card when you wanna use the public transportation system in New York City. It should be free and accessible and easy to use and we should expand it as much as possible. Unfortunately, here in New York, the MTA board is also full of corrupt people who are in the pockets of people like Governor Andrew Cuomo, or former governor, I should say. Uh, but Kathy Hochul isn't much better, uh, to be quite honest, but that's a different conversation. I think we need to get the money out of politics. Now, obviously, that would require, um, you know, the overturning of Citizens United. But in the meantime, we should be, uh, as candidates, promising to reject any special interest money, uh, especially from corporate PACs and lobbyists. Uh, in addition, if there are any other progressive policies that Green should pursue in the country, uh, I would say uh, that, again, when it comes to our prisons, we should have all of our nonviolent drug offenders uh, completely expunge their records. And they should not be in the same facilities as people who committed uh, uh, acts of violence like murder and rape. Uh, these people, uh, in particular, if they have some sort of addiction, should be rehabilitated. And there's more than enough money to create real working rehabilitation centers across the country if we were to just tax a fraction of the trillions of dollars in wealth that a few dozen uh, corporate corporations and politicians were able to amass uh, through Nancy Pelosi, for example, buying Tesla stock and doing insider trading. If you were to take just a sliver of that money uh, that they exploited workers during this pandemic and actually fund the people with it, you would be able to have a much safer society. And when we have a safer society, you there would be no need for as many police on our streets. Yeah, I would argue that incarceration costs more than treatment. You just need to transfer the money. That's what defunding the police, rearranging priorities is about. Yeah, the yeah, metropolitan transit the private prisons. It's a one big money making scheme. Yep. It's like uh, the Pentagon, you know, arms contracts. So the arms contractors want wars to get more contracts. But uh, the MTA, which is the Metropolitan Transit Authority, yeah, this is an issue. Back in 2010, when I first ran for governor, and you know, I used to say the MTA was an ATM for Wall Street because they're underfunded by the public, you know, the taxation and the and the fares uh, to to ride the rails. So they borrow money, particularly for capital investments, and then the banks make interest, and it's always cheaper to pay for this stuff up front than to borrow from the rich and pay them interest for the you know, pleasure of using their money. So, yeah, that's huge corruption there as well. And it's really a form of privatizing the finances of public transportation. And uh, that's a tough problem because the state as well as the city have a big say in who's on the MTA board and, and, and who runs it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And you, one thing that New York City hasn't really utilized very well is our waterways. You know, we used to have a ferry service that would go from Wall Street to LaGuardia Airport. I mean, why have we stopped that? That's actually pretty amazing. I know ferries might not be as efficient as the subway, but I mean, come on. I Look at Amsterdam, for example. They have ferries that go back and forth on a daily basis. P people bring their bicycles onto the ferry. I see no reason why we can't have that in New York City. The New York City ferry system is here, but uh, it could be way more efficient. If we could have it coming every 10 minutes, for example... That would be an amazing way to bring people uh, from point A to point B without having to be in an enclosed space like a, a subway train where they could be out on the deck in an open air environment with zero risk of the spreading of the coronavirus. 
You know, the fairies are popular. I have petitioned and handed out campaign leaflets when the Staten Island ferry comes to Manhattan, in lower Manhattan. And there's always lots of people there. And lots of people, that's how they get, that's how they commute. So, yeah, that could definitely be expanded. I agree with you, Howie. So, Scout Trooper 164, hey, Edwin, how would you ensure that the Green New Deal gets formulated in New York City? Well, I think the number one thing I like to do, yeah. oh, you could see my dog in the background there. One of the number one things I like to do is inform the public on the key differences between the Democratic version of the Green New Deal and Howie's original bill that I, I believe you wrote in 2006, which calls for at least double the amount of jobs, a, a key transition for workers, which is a very important thing. Uh, one of the things that, you know, is very important, like, say, for the example, the first week of Biden's presidency with the uh, Keystone pipeline that was closed, on the surface level, that sounds good. But what about the thousands of workers who weren't guaranteed a job? You need to ensure that every single worker has the ability to put food on their table as we divest away from fossil fuels. And you can do that by guaranteeing them job placement and job training in similar professions within the realm of green technology and green infrastructure uh, and with union high, uh, high wage paying jobs with benefits. Uh, that's how we can get people on board with our climate initiatives so they don't feel like they have to be forced to learn something like computer coding. And uh, finally, letting people know that, hey, the Democrats' plan of 50% emissions by 2030 is not going to actually save the planet. We're going to have the polar ice caps melt. We're going to have the sea levels rise. And we're going to con uh, continue to deplete our ozone layer the more that we have um, this delaying of the climate crisis. Sure, Republicans might not actually believe in the uh, in climate change, but is it any better that Democrats want to keep stalling and stalling till the point of no return? I think it's very important that we call for zero emissions by 2030. And I'm going to do that because I don't have, I'm not subservient to any corporate masters as a Green Party candidate. Uh, I don't have to report to Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or Eric Adams. Uh, none of these people will be my boss. So if I want to fight for uh, zero emissions by 2030, that's what I'm going to do. Take it or leave it. Amy L. Sachs, Edwin, it's very common in some lefty online circles to hear, forget all electoral politics, politics and just hit the streets. Do you encounter these folks? And if so, what do you tell them? I love this question, and, and there's many ways I can answer it. Um, I'll start by saying this. I was the lead organizer for the New York City March for Medicare for All, which was a very authentic grassroots movement that was not uh, founded by or supported by any institution. Uh, it was completely ordinary people coming together, a rainbow coalition, you know, people who were able to take off from work that day if they could, coming together to fight for a cause in the streets. Uh, and we were able to actually make somewhat of a dent. Granted, we didn't get huge media coverage, but we had Susan Sarandon come out to be our keynote speaker. Christian Smalls, the Amazon whistleblower, was our MC. It really only takes a few people to uh, break the matrix, to actually scare the establishment. You know, 10 people outside a congressional office, believe it or not, that does scare politicians because it does affect their reputation. Now, on the flip side, this is not mutually exclusive with electoral politics. You can be someone who fights for uh, these kind of protests in the street, whether it be the March for Medicare for All, whether it be going to uh, uh, Congress to fight for something like Force the Vote or any of these other online movements. You can also simultaneously support statewide initiatives for single-payer health care like the New York Health Act like CalCare, like other initiatives across the country. These all go in tandem. And I think what's the most uh, important next steps forward is that we all come together to pool our resources and find the best multi-strategy way to achieve social change. But for people who have completely given up on electoral politics, I mean, look, I completely understand why. I mean, at this point, the fact that even AOC has abandoned some of her key most policies, including freedom for the Palestinian people, only proves that there's there's not much faith to have, but there's not much faith to have in the two-party duopoly. I do think that if enough people were to vote Green Party or even other third parties, that we can actually have a movement behind us. And the more the people that say, well, third part, voting for a third party is not viable, so I'm not going to vote for them, the more people you get not voting for them, and then the less 
viable they seem. It's a it's a cycle. It's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy. But every each and one of you has to take individual responsibility and say, I'm going to start the trend. I'm not going to wait for a bandwagon. I'm going to vote for Howie like I did in 2020. And we're going to get 5% of that vote uh, for president so that we can get the millions of dollars in FEC funding. It takes some a level of optimism, but not one that I would say is in the clouds. It's a very real viable thing. The person who ran green in, in our district a few years ago, she got 14% of the vote. And that was before the coronavirus pandemic. So more people, I think, now than ever are waking up to, to this, the detriments of this two-party system and the detriments of late-stage capitalism that we are actively fighting to mitigate and actively fighting to extinguish all of the suffering that working-class people are currently facing. Yeah, I agree with all that. I just want to add that without, uh, if you have protests, even big protests, without candidates offering an alternative, the politicians in power, and we're basically lobbying Democrats when we protest, take us for granted. In the run-up to the war on Iraq, the New York Times called us the world's second superpower because so many people were out protesting. But when it came to the election, most of the peace movement got behind Kerry, who was pro-war too. And, and you know, Nader was vilified. So off we went to war. So you got to have alternative candidates on the other hand, without a movement in the streets, the candidates begin to adapt. I think that's AOC uh, when she does adapt and others. So we got to have both. And, you know, as I was saying during the campaign, uh, you know, if you settle for the lesser evil because it's not, we're not going to win the office, you get lost in the sauce. You voted for Biden. They don't know you're for Medicare for all or Green New Deal. You just silenced your voice. And then, you know, you don't have to win the office to make a difference. In 2014, I got 5% running for governor against Andrew Cuomo. Cuomo had wanted to run up the vote, get ready to run for president. He got less votes. He wanted to get more than his daddy ever got. He got less votes than his daddy got. He got less votes than when he was elected in 2010. So to compete for those votes that I got, he had to adopt some of our demands. We got a ban on fracking. We got the $15 minimum wage. And we got paid family leave. So that's where that 5% makes a difference. It may not get you the office, but it is power. And that's why it's so important that people vote for what they want. Because if you don't, nobody's going to know what you want. So that's why people in Astoria got to vote for Edwin. Okay, let's take the next question. Vote your conscience. KRTD Media. What are your thoughts on independent media? Mainstream media refuses to cover third-party candidates, tell the truth, or even talk about many issues. Well, that's an excellent question. And I guess it really depends on which independent media institutions are you talking about. Uh, are you talking about, uh, you know, Brianna Joy Gray's uh, podcast, which I'm a big fan of, uh, Bad Faith? Or are you talking about the Young Turks, which in several instances, uh, I think, have kind of failed to keep up to their promise of rejecting the special interest monies of corporations, considering the fact that they're billionaire funded. But in general, I support independent, uh, independent media all the way. And I think it's a big shame that a lot of the big tech giants are trying to censor people who aren't necessarily promoting misinformation, but they're just going against the mainstream narrative. You understand information is power. So uh, they, he or she who controls all the information controls all the power. And whether or not you watch you know, CNN or Fox News, you're still watching the same kind of, uh, this, th th these two, I would say you'll watch the same event. And regardless of whether you watch it on CNN or, or Fox, you're gonna get two entirely different accounts. Um, but at the end of the day, they still seek to serve the interests of the establishment. And they're purposely trying to divide us so that it is easier to conquer us. If a population is angry at each other, if they look at their brother and sister and say, oh, I despise you because of the color of your skin or because of any other factor about you personally, uh, then we're going to be too distracted to actually focus and redirect our anger on the real target, which should be the ruling class. And this is all part of the agenda of the large corporations so that they and their greed can... Uh, maximize profits. And that's what it all comes down to is the greed for profit. 
And I think a lot of the mainstream media is complicit in that. Uh, just look back during the coverage of the Iraq war uh, or even with the Afghanistan withdrawal, they're trying to make the narrative that war is a good thing when in reality it's not. Uh, but it's very clear that they are, you know, in the pockets of the military industrial complex and that there is definitely a relationship between the mainstream media uh, and these large conglomerates like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Boeing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. At War With Dust is incentivizing worker cooperatives and government owned enterprises something we can do at the municipal level or does it require state and federal legislation? I believe it can be done at the municipal level. And I think it's very important that we have these kind of worker cooperatives incentivized uh, so that it's easier to actually uh, create these kind of businesses and that there's no obstructions because of uh, financial reasons. You know, for example, you know, marijuana, which has recently been legalized, we want to make sure that we actually have the rights for home growers and the small marijuana companies. We don't just want all of this revenue going to the big uh, marijuana industry. Uh, we want to make sure that even though there's local mom and pop dispensaries that can benefit from this legalization uh, and that we aren't going to make sure that taxes are burdensome for the uh, working class people and low income people who want to buy from these smaller shops. Uh, I think it is something that can be done, uh, but obviously if the state and federal level can get involved, that would be much better. Uh, but I think if city council were united around this issue, it can definitely be done. Yeah, it was uh, Gail McLaughlin as green mayor of Richmond, California, that introduced one of the first programs of municipal support for worker co-ops. And that's been picked up by some uh, cities in New York. De Blasio has a token worker co-op program that I haven't heard much about since it was announced in a news conference. There's one in Rochester. And I know that's token because the guy running it is from Syracuse. And I worked with him on a co-op project. He don't really believe in co-ops. So they kind of, you know, get the headline, but not the substance. But I think that's definitely something we can do. And I think it needs to be coupled with a public bank with an entrepreneurial department. And I have experience, I've been in a worker co-op. I worked for a nonprofit that tried to organize them back in the 90s. And what you really need is what the Mondragon Co-op Network did in Spain, in the Basque region, where you had the Bank of People's Labor actually would do the business plans for these co-ops, hire the workers, train them for the job as well as worker self-management, and then turn it over to the workers. Uh, if you just try to get some, you know, grassroots people like I worked in construction and have them come together and start a co-op, just here's the money, write up a business plan, you know, you're on your own, it's not going to happen. So you really need technical assistance and financial assistance. And that's where I think public banks could play a big role if they're set up with that as a priority. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll refer back to one of the policies on um, Senator Sanders' platform, which was having workers having a stake of ownership on the board of these large corporations. Uh, and also one of the things that I support, which would be municipalizing the energy industry. Uh, in our district, uh, they're trying to build this uh, uh, fracked gas peaker plant. Uh, I think that would be disastrous for the community, disastrous for people like my father who suffer from respiratory illness. I think they should completely municipalize the energy industry here in New York. Yes, public power, public energy system. Chen Chiyahui, I think New York City's subway system needs a serious update. I don't necessarily think that it should be free, but a strong public transit system is, in my opinion, the basis of a strong community. I agree. And you can look at cities like Shanghai, China, for example, where their subway system is not only incredibly fast and efficient, but they are super clean. The stations are nearly spotless. I mean, it's it's almost like unbelievable how advanced their public transportation system is. Why can't New York City uh, be up to par with something like that? A lot of it has to do with corruption and greed. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know, we uh, are so dependent um, on other uh, forms of, of transportation that rely on fossil fuels. 
I think a lot of it really can be uh, changed. It just requires courage from political leaders to oust the members of the MTA board uh, who are purposely keeping the money all for themselves. And I think you are absolutely right. The subway system needs a serious update. Why did it take like so many years and so much money uh, just to expand the Upper East Side uh, Q train on the Second Avenue line? I mean, there should be, uh, I don't think it necessarily has to deal with cutting back regulation, but there needs to be some sort of a policy change that can expedite these kinds of developments so that if we have a plan to uh, expand our subway system, it can be done within a year or two, not a decade. Scott Trooper 164, Edwin, what are your thoughts on crime in New York City? Yeah, like I said before, a lot of uh, the, the data points to a spike in crime in New York City, and this tends to be one of the voters' top issues. Now, like I said before, when you have a society where wealth and income inequality is at the highest point that it's ever been in human history, you can expect people to commit crime. Now, I'm not saying all crimes are committed out of poverty. I mean, some people do uh, just want to hurt and abuse others. But in other scenarios, and this is something that actually personally happened to me, somebody pulled a knife out on me trying to steal my bike. And I won't say 100% guarantee if they had the money to buy their own bike, they wouldn't have tried robbing me. But I think it's clear to say that, well, if people can actually have the resources to survive, they're not going to resort to these kinds of activities that are violent in order to, you know, have their own resources by stealing from others. If you can give people direct payments, if you give people healthcare, you give people education, you refund mutual aid programs on the ground, you buy back guns like they're doing in Brownsville to actually great success, believe it or not, you can actually create a safer society where if we are more uh, uh, equitable on an economic playing field, that you would probably see um, a much safer and just society that would not necessarily require uh, the this mili strong militarization that we currently have of the police force, uh, where you know you have politicians saying, "Hey, we need to do something about uh, the police," and then they end up just voting to keep funding them more and more, but it's not solving the actual problem at hand because we need more preventative measures in place. Yeah, and the police don't prevent crimes; they they catch people after they're committed. And you know, if they're on the corner, the crime's not going to happen on that corner, but you know, they'll take the crime to the next corner. You know, if it's a some kind of illicit, you know, drug deal or fencing stolen property or whatever. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that crime as a whole has not gone up over the last year and a half. And I'm not sure about New York City, but the country as a whole, it's gone down. It's only murders and shootings that have gone up. And it's primarily among low income communities of color, kids and gangs shooting at each other. That's the problem. So instead of just getting more cops, focus on that. And go back to Richmond, California, where under Gail McLaughlin, the green mayor, they had a targeted program where they went to the likely shooters and they said, we're going to help you. We're going to get you a job. You stay out of trouble. You get, I think it was $1,000 a month for a year. They got a philanthropist to donate that. Um, and their murder rate, which is one of the highest in the country, going back to the 70s, the 60s. This is a low-income, working-class community, 80% people of color. Went from, you know, city of 100,000 uh, murders in the 40s to eight murders. Or maybe it was seven murders by the eighth year of that program. So that's a program that worked because they targeted the likely shooters and helped those mostly young men uh, find another path. And it wasn't the police that did that. It was a program parallel to what the police were doing. They had a community policing program that was pretty good too. But um, that's just to underscore what Edwin's saying. We got an example where it worked. You know, we should we should implement it. And, and they're doing that in New York City as well, actually. They recently started a, 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 um, a, a pilot program for uh, mental health experts to to respond to specific crises, and it has been successful so far. And I do think that by extinguishing poverty, we can actually disincentivize a lot of crime. And by ending the school to prison pipeline, we can also disincentivize people committing crimes as well.
Well, we're coming up on an hour, and I think, yep, it's time to move for closing statements. So, Evan, why don't you uh, make your last pitch to people, and uh, be sure to tell them to give you some money. It takes money to run a campaign. It absolutely does. And fortunately, if you do live in New York City, every dollar you uh, contribute gets matched eight to one. Uh, so if you know anybody in New York City, you can tell them to go to the website at the bottom of your screen, edwinfornyc.com. Uh, That's F-O-R-N-Y-C.com. There's a big yellow donate button there. You know, $5, $6, every little bit counts. It goes towards mailing uh, literature to the community, goes to text banking and phone banking. Uh, if you want to get involved, there's also a, a portion of the website uh, where you can sign up to volunteer as well. This is how we're actually going to make change. It's not going to be super fancy. The revolution's not going to be televised. We have to do it in a way that, that, uh, where we take the revolution outside of the two-party duopoly and we stand up to the establishment. We don't make peace agreements with them. We don't play patty cake with our corporate overlords. We tell them to their face, you are the enemy. You will be extinguished. And that's how we're going to do it. We're going to fight uh, like our lives depend on it because clearly the planet depends on it. Our children and grandchildren, uh, their lives depend on it. And I think it all goes down to how can each and uh, every one of us make an individual difference. So I hope that you can please uh, you know, support our campaign, support any other green candidates that are, are nearby you where you live in your city across the country. Uh, and let's get to work because clearly uh, the Democrats and Republicans uh, are too busy fighting each other to actually care about the people who put them into office. Edwin, tell us what you had to do to qualify for those matching funds, because that tells us this is a serious campaign, because this isn't that easy to do. Yeah, so, yeah. So you have to uh, receive at least $5,000 in, in eligible contributions from New York City residents, and you have to get at least 75 contributors from your district to donate $10 or more. And I will say this, in terms of getting on the ballot, uh, during the, the pandemic, Governor Cuomo actually lessened the signature requirement for just Democrats and Republicans. He did not lower it for these independent candidates like myself who are running under the Green Party ballot line. So I actually had to collect hundreds of more signatures than your typical Democratic politician uh, in the middle of a pandemic uh, because Governor Cuomo didn't deem it necessary to actually um, uh, be lowered in the face of a public health crisis. So, in addition to eliminating our ballot status entirely last year and trying to cancel the New York Democratic primary, uh, even though Sanders had already suspended his campaign, tried canceling the election. So I hope people will contribute to Edwin's campaign. It's serious. It's making a difference in Astoria. And it's making a difference for Greens, you know, who are trying to get our ballot line back. You know, that idiot Cuomo... I don't know if idiot's the right word. He's pretty smart. You know, that corrupt Cuomo uh, said, well, we had to get rid of the third parties because now we're going to have state public campaign financing and we can't afford to have that many candidates publicly financed. The problem with that is the money doesn't go to parties. It goes to candidates. It goes to people like Edwin. He didn't have a green ballot line. He had to do an independent nominating petition with all those extra signatures just to get on the ballot. And he qualified for matching fund under New York City's plan. We could do the same thing statewide. So Cuomo is full of it. And that big lie, the media, it just didn't dawn on them. You know, we talk about the media here and, you know, another thing they've missed is that uh, this Freedom to Vote Act eliminates public campaign financing for presidential candidates. I've talked about that on previous podcasts. And we've been having a hell of a time getting any, you know, mainstream media to even report that. This was a major post-Watergate reform. And they're like, they don't care. So I had a piece in Counterpunch a couple weeks ago. Truth Out has accepted a piece that I wrote with Mike Feinstein that might even be up by now. They, they, they approved it yesterday. So we're getting the word out little by little. But, you know, it's really an uphill battle. So... I guess, you know, to sum up what I feel about this week, Greta Thunberg did it when she was at the Milan Youth Climate Summit in uh, Italy. 
last week and on Tuesday, she started mocking all the world leaders. And what she said about Biden was, build back better, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, she sees clearly what's going on and I hope the rest of us do it. And we get out there and start fighting. So thanks for being here. Next week, we'll have Connor Mulvaney, city council candidate from, uh, for the green candidate from Pittsburgh. Oh, the, it's already up. Somebody put it up. The link to the Truth Out article is in the chat. So see you all next week. And thanks, Edwin, for, for coming on. Thank you so much, Howie.